I think Pastor Liz and Reverend Greg for praying for me. It's a great honor. And not only did they pray for me, but they prayed for us at this moment. Now let us pray. God, so much has happened this week. All that we have no control over. But our great joy and solace is that you are in control. You promised them to leave us and forsake us. We believe it. We thank you. Now, we'd like to hear from you, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I was listening to Ken Burns' uh, documentary on jazz, and I heard Winton Marcella say some words that I said, oh my goodness, that's a sermon. When will we be, what will we be, when we become ourselves, is what he said. And he was talking about jazz being a great unifier and a great gift to the world from this country. And I thought about that, and it turned in my mind, and I said, hmm, I think I hear you talking, God. What will we be when we become ourselves? And the scripture that came with it is 1 Corinthians 13, 1, 11 through 13, and it reads thusly. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooled like any infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. We are squinting in a fog, peering through the mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly, just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly. And the best of these is love, which goes back to the beginning. <coughs> what will we be when we become ourselves? I was talking with a good friend this week. Um, she's the mother of my goddaughter. And um, uh, my goddaughter, Amanda, is having a boy and girl twin. Um, if she doesn't go into labor on her own, they will take them on Tuesday. The little girl is eating up all the nutrients. The little boy's okay, but he's definitely small. But he's going to be born first. <laughs> but she was saying something to me that struck me. And I felt it myself, and I wonder if perhaps you felt it. Sometimes we're ashamed to say we're a Christian. Because of the way Christians act. Say so. We're ashamed. I was going to look up the man's name, but I decided it's better if I don't even say his name. And yes, sometimes I'm political. <coughs> but I want it, I'm saying it because I want us to look at what God requires of us in the real world, not in our imaginations, in the real world. There was a senator this week who was praying at a uh, convention, a White House gathering, and he prayed for the president. He, he, he pointed to a scripture and said, may his life be shortened. May his children be fatherless and his wife husband less, and may your wrath fall on his head, almighty God. Of the place, in the U.S. Senate, in fact, this man who calls himself a Christian prayed such words against another child of God. One of the things that I've learned as a Christian is I don't really have to like you in order to treat you with respect. I don't have to like your ways, and you don't have to like my ways, in order to accord me some dignity, you some dignity, just as a human being who breathes on the earth. Now why is it important for me to say that now, and what does this servant have to do with anything? Becoming a Christian, becoming a Christ follower is a process we don't wake up one morning and go, you know, 
All my sins are gone. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> and I will live for the rest of my life as the perfect being that I am. That just does not happen, y'all. It hadn't happened with me, and I take myself as a rather a template. I'm like every other human being. There's some stuff, some habits I don't have. That doesn't mean I'm great about it. I just don't have that habit. So if I don't do those things, it's not any grace and mercy according to me. I just don't have that habit. I don't have the taste for that. My mom always used to say, you know, I got a taste for some vanilla ice cream. You better taste for something. Now, if you don't like vanilla ice cream, you're not going to have a taste for it. That doesn't mean you're, you're a sin, sinless. It means you just don't have a taste for vanilla ice cream. But everybody got a taste for something, right? Everybody got a taste for something. And just because my taste is not your taste, I don't get to say, oh, I'm better than you because I never have a taste for strawberry. <laughs> and those sinners over there, all in, they eat strawberry ice cream. They go to hell. Right, right. When Christians, when so-called Christians talk about other people, when we pray to God that they will die, that their children will be raped, that also happened this week. We are not Christian when we do that. We say that in God we trust. We say we're one nation under God. My experience is that we are lying through our teeth. We're lying through our teeth. And don't you understand that not only God knows it, but everybody looking at us knows it. Because when I heard the words, I said, he has no eye. It's not easy. 
Say it again. It's not easy. I know what I know. You know what you know. And we have a nasty habit, human beings do, of deciding that because it doesn't hurt us, it shouldn't hurt you. You don't live in my body. I don't live in your body. I do not have the right to tell you what hurts you. I have no idea what hurts you. And you have no idea what hurts me. Because we live in different bodies. I have never in my life told a white person how to be white. Because I don't know. White people have no problem telling me what I ought to feel, what I ought to think. And I'm always in questions like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Are you just crazy? That's basic human politeness. <clears throat> a basic understanding of what it means to be human. I don't know all your story, Bruce. And so I don't have any right judging you about some things. Now, if I see you doing stuff that hurt you, I'll say, well, Bruce, I'm worried about you. Are you OK? Well, Will, I don't think you ought to be doing that. I can say that. We can say that. But I can't condemn you. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. And I'm not telling you all of it. <coughs> Just like you're not telling me all of it. God knows. But what we all have in common is that we're all broken humanity. And God has given all of us a chance to come together. Yeah to be whole, to be healthy. Yeah. It does not help us to become healthy when we're looking down our nose at other people, when we're letting ourselves be divided by money, by race, by sexual preference, by any other things that divide us, by disability or, in, or, or, or lack of disability. We are called to be better than that. And we're also called to speak up when people who claim to be God followers and the lights of Christ, when they say stuff that we know is wrong. I'm sorry, Senator, you wrong. That you're a liar, the truth is not in you. Nobody who knows Jesus says such things, or if they begin saying such things, they start growing in Christ and they change. Their hearts change. And one day they come to the point where they repent of such behavior. George Wallace, who set dogs on people during the Civil Rights Movement, before he closed his eyes, he apologized. He says, I'm wrong. I was wrong. There are many things in my life that I've had to say I'm wrong for, and there will be many more things in my life that I will have to say I'm wrong for. I, as Maya Angelou tells us, when we know better, we, we do, do better. better. Yes, sir. But we're in the process of learning how to be and do better. That's what church is. We learn how to do and be better. There's no way that we can be a church, a community, a city, a, a state, a country. If we are going to learn how to put up with each other. I know some things from my life that you may never have experienced. I don't begrudge the fact that you experienced that or, you did, or, or that I didn't or that I experienced something and you didn't. I have a healthy dislike of cops, y'all. <laughs> While I understand that they're necessary and I know that they're not all bad, and some of y'all got relatives who are cops, I have been taught that you do not trust a cop. <laughs> it's in me. I can't get it out. It's in me. It may not be your experience, but it's my experience. And when I go to act in my life, I'm not going to call on your experience. I'm going to call on what I know. I'm going to call on what I know. It's how I still manage to be alive, y'all. Now, we look at folks all the time and we make judgments. When I see young white university girls running, at 10 o'clock at night on dark streets, I send up a prayer, because in my view, that's right stupid. Yes. yes. But I don't go, oh, let me call the police and say, this stupid girl is doing this. I say a prayer, because I already know they don't understand where they are. <coughs> and I send up a prayer of protection, because my experience tells me that 
you don't put yourself in harm's way unnecessarily. Sometimes we can't help it. But I can help whether I'm going to go running at 10 o'clock at night when there's nobody about or whether I'm going to go at 10 in the morning. That can be helped. But the problem is she doesn't know. She doesn't know. There are a lot of them who don't know. So how do I handle that? If I see them, I stop my car and I say, baby, let me tell you something. Do right. you understand where yes. you live in? Do you understand you're at the University of Virginia and the rape culture is alive and well? You have put yourself, yes I do, you have put yourself in harm's way. Carry your skinny butt back home. <laughs> say so. Yes. And come out at an hour when you are most le yes. least likely to be harmed. Because I know you feel invincible, but you are not. Right. Preach, preach. But you are not. You aren't. We owe it to each other because there are things that I know that you don't know, and there are things that you know that I don't know. And I need you to tell me. You, and you need me to tell you. That's what it is to be community. That's what it is to become Christ people. We look out for each other. We don't look for ways that we can be divided. They're already there. We don't have to make it up. They're already there. I grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia, where the black folks I knew did not come to this side of town. I think it's amazing. It's, I, sometimes I, get, I, get, I, st I just start laughing because as a child, I didn't put foot in Belmont. <laughs> Because I knew I wasn't welcome and what was the need to go. Well, don't go to places you're not welcome if you can help it. Yes. Belmont was now Martha Jefferson Hospital. If you were a black woman and you were, your baby's head was coming out, they would not take you in that hospital. They would let you lay on that doorstep and have that baby and do the best you could. This is what I know. It's what I know. Nobody told me. I know it for myself. And so one of the things that God has to do with me is to open my heart to understand that not all white people are like that. Not all black people are good and lovely and, 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 and hallelujah perfect. I know that. I know that. And you know some stuff. And you feel the way you do because of the things that have happened to you. But what God asks you and me and everybody to do is to take our life's experiences and give them all to God and let him wash us clean and let us come to have a different understanding of what has happened to us. Because at the core of Christianity is the necessity to forgive. <clears throat> Every time I breathe, I offend somebody. It's true. Some of y'all offended right now. You'll live. <laughs> Every time you breathe, you offend somebody. <laughs> we don't mean to. It's not our thought. It's not our purpose in living and breathing. It just happens because we are different from one another. We are different. And the difference is God made. It's God made. We're supposed to figure it out. By the help of God, we will figure out how the, can all these different people with all these different minds, different hearts, different bodies, different understandings, how can we all come together as one? It isn't easy, but by the grace of God, with the blood of Christ, we can do it. We must do it, or we're going to destroy each other in this place. We are asked to love one another. A mammoth task. It's huge. I do not love everybody, y'all. And neither do you. You know how I know? Because we don't know everybody. We're not even called to love everybody. We're called to deal with the folks that we deal with. Can you handle that? Can you handle that? No, we can't even handle that without Christ. So stop lying. I love everybody. No, you don't. Preach, preach. I love everybody. I do not like a whole lot of folk, frankly. <laughs> and they don't love me, frankly. But God has called me and them and you to get not only get along with each other, but to learn. Learn to love. We have to learn it. It is not something we're born knowing. <laughs>
be in. We've got to learn it. We are not born knowing it. This congregation is singular. It's important. It's exceptional. We have more different kinds of folks than most congregations will allow. Well, you can say that again. The truth of the matter is a lot of churches don't want everybody. And we advertise it, but we really just want the kind of folk we want. If you look at the roster, if you look at how people behave, churches behave, the real truth is that we do not welcome everybody. Now, if you've got a house of prayer that's open in Jesus' name, that's going to have to change because Jesus will, spend, will send exactly the kind of folk you don't want up in his house because it's his house. Now, the moment because it's not his house, then it's not church. And y'all can do whatever you want then. But if it's not God's house, do whatever you please. I won't be there. But if it's not God's house, you can do what you want. But if it's God's house, we have to be open to God's correction, God's movement. And we got to let in the doors whom God says let in the door. Now, God says, be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. If somebody's got a knife out there and go threatening to come in here and kill somebody, I love you as a brother in Christ, but you can't come in here. You hear me? You got to get you some help. We'll help you get you some help. But till you get that help, because until you are certified to have gotten that help, you got to stay out there for a minute, because I'm not stupid. Loving people doesn't mean we give people a pass and don't hold them responsible for their actions. It does mean that we give them the space to be, to become, to change, just as God has given us the space to be, become, and change. But we don't let them hurt themselves, and we don't let them hurt each other. You hear what I'm saying? There's a balance. Yes, yes, yes. There's a balance. If I already know that you're coming for me with a gun, am I not going to call the police? Just because it's a church, am I going to let you in the door if I know it? You hear what I'm saying? It's not being a Christian to say, no, you can't come in here with a gun. Right. <laughs> it's acting like you've got good sense. <laughs> There's a balance. There's a balance. How do we know how to balance? How are the guidelines for balancing? What will we be when we become ourselves? How do we become ourselves? Because life is about becoming the you that God means you to be. It's about me becoming the person God sent me here to become. What will we be when we become ourselves? The text says, when I first started out, when I was a baby, I acted like all babies do. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now, I see one, one little bitty baby in here and one toddler in here. Everybody else at the moment is grown. We, we understand when Selena runs back and forth and is loud that she's a toddler. But we who are 35 and 40 and 100 million years old, we ought not to be acting like that. Right? But sometimes we do. Sometimes we leave our phones off. I know I did math mine the other day. I thought I turned it down and I didn't. But we know, we know the rules. Sometimes we're talking way too loudly up in here, y'all. Last week, somebody <laughs> opened the back door. We weren't finished with service. Y'all know when service ends. Y'all know that when we, when we do it, the prayer at the end, the service is not over. Oh, God, I'm like, oh, hey, child, how you doing? <laughs> what? what? Grow up!
as we know it comes. We don't know everything. We don't understand everything. We don't get in everything. But when we start to walk with God, the stuff that we don't understand, the stuff that we don't like, the stuff that we wish were not so, God starts putting it in perspective. Our eyes clear. Have you ever been to the eye doctor? Amazing as we, he goes to the lenses and he gets clear. Like, oh, I'm looking at lenses. Now, without those corrective lenses, I got contacts in y'all. Without those corrective lenses, I can't see Jack. I just can't. But with the corrective lenses, the whole world changes. Jesus is a corrective lens. Yes. A corrective lens. The stuff that we didn't, didn't see and didn't even know we were seeing all of a sudden becomes clear. Yes. When we look through the connect, collected, co 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 corrective lens of Jesus, which is to say when we start looking at ourselves and each other in the world through the eyes of love, <coughs>
God says, try it. You might get one. You might like it. <laughs> I co-pastored New Beginnings with Elizabeth Embry, who is white. Clearly, you very white. <laughs> We're not what we're supposed to be yet, but we're not what we used to be. Some of us used to be addicts. We're not. Some are still addicts, but by the grace of God, you will not always be an addict. Some of us used to be liars and cheaters and stealers, but by the grace of God, we are not that anymore. Some of us used to be racist and prejudiced. But by the grace of God, we don't have to stay that way. Some of us used to love nobody but ourselves, but we understand that the world is so small when there's nobody in it but you or me. 